Good evening, good afternoon, everybody from wherever you may be joining us. I am John Hain, Head of Research at Asia Art Archive, and it is my distinct privilege, my distinct pleasure, to welcome you to the third life lesson, a year-long series of conversations and workshops with artists and art collectives who teach at universities, build educational programs at arts organizations, and run their own schools. Each session is meant to address uh, unique perspectives on teaching and learning. The series contributes to a larger focus on pedagogy as a research perspective at Asia Art Archive uh, and looking at the role of art pedagogy in art schools in the development of modern and contemporary art in Asia and beyond. It also forms part of a suite of events and activities marking the 20th anniversary of AAA here in Hong Kong. Life Lessons, as part of the AAA Learning and Participation Program, is supported by the SH Ho Foundation Limited and CK and K Ho Foundation. Today's program, Practice Makes Perfect, features the esteemed artists Wu Ma Li and Suzanne Lacey. Wu Ma Li, recently dubbed the godmother of socially engaged art in Taiwan, attended the National Art Academy Dusseldorf, where she studied sculpture with Gunter Ucker and Klaus Winke. After her studies, she returned to Taiwan in 1985 and has been a groundbreaking artist since, working in the genres of conceptual art, installation, and social practice, and has also been a leading voice in feminist and environmental concerns. She has had a huge place in, shifts, in shifting the ground in uh, uh, art discourse in Greater China through her work on landmark uh, publications such as Art and Public Sphere, Working in Community, a translation of Mapping the Terrain, New Genre of Public Art, and exhibitions such as Post Nature of a Museum as an Ecosystem at the 11th Taipei Biennial, which she co-curated with Francesco Manacorda. She directs the Graduate in Institute of Interdisciplinary Art at National Kaohsiung uh, Normal University. Suzanne Lacey, uh, our other guest, first trained as a zoologist before becoming involved with the historic feminist art program first at Cal State Fresno, and then at CalArts, where she worked with Judy Chicago and Alan Capra. Her work has taken many forms, performance, video, installations, but she is perhaps most widely known for her work in socially engaged art and public practice, which, fre fre which frequently involves uh, community organizing, media in intervention, and choreographed performance. She edited Mapping the Terrain, New Genre of Public Art in 1995, and has been a leading voice in feminist art education and social practice. She has served as Dean of California College of the Arts, has been a founding, was a founding member, a uh, faculty member at California State University of Monterey Bay, and had, was chair of fine arts and creator of the MFA program in public practice at Otis College of Art and Design, before assuming the professorship of art at USC Roski School of Art and Design. In short, when it comes to questions of feminism and other social concerns in art, Molly and Suzanne have been foundational voices and important teachers. Just as uh, significant, they happen to be longtime friends, and I look forward to speaking with them. Before we start, I just want to let everyone know that the conversation will last about an hour, and then we will open it up to the audience. And people joining us should feel free to type in questions on either Zoom or Facebook. So let's get started. Um, uh, welcome, Molly. Welcome, Suzanne. Um, I thought we could begin, since this is a question, this is a series looking at questions of uh, teaching and learning and pedagogy. Uh, both of you went to, you know, renowned uh, schools and educational uh, contexts, and I was wondering if maybe you could say a little about what you learned from them, either the Kunst Academy in Dusseldorf, or in the case of you, Molly, or in the case of feminist, uh, the feminist art program and Cal Arts, in your case, Suzanne, um, because you know I think both of these are storied institutions and uh, have kind of a lot of um, legends about them, right? And so it'd be interesting to hear, you know, from your perspective, what it was that uh, you got from them, and if it was there that you know you felt like you received your formative educational experience as an artist. Um, Molly, maybe we can be, begin with uh, your experiences in Dusseldorf. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would like to say that before I went to Dusseldorf, actually, I began my art study in Vienna. So I was in the um, uh, Kunsthochschule für Angewandte Kunst. So um, it's, it's, it's 
um, the most important avant-garde art school by the time in Vienna. And for example, uh, one of my teacher was Peter Weiber, who is the director of ZKM now. So, uh, and also uh, we have a lot of very interesting guest, guest lecturer like Hermann Nietzsche, who is the, also the key figure of the uh, Vienna actionism by the time. And also certainly Joseph Beuys, was also one of the um, the yeah. curator at the time, and I think there were a lot of experimental things going on there. Uh, when I was there, it's about uh, 1980, so a lot of um, avant-garde thing and also very experimental things was happening. And later on, I uh, moved to Düsseldorf and I studied with Klaus Rinke who was also a performance artist and tried to combine with sculpture. So all these experiences uh, was very important uh, for me because I realized that the, the art form is so open and so free, you know, whatever, whatever uh, you have to say or what kind of media you would like to use. I mean, it, it, it was really a very, very uh, experimental time for me. And that's, that's really um, helped me a lot to work in the so-called interdisciplinary art. Okay, interesting. Uh, Suzanne, do you want to say anything about uh, the feminist art program and CalArts? Yeah, you know, I, I was in grad school in psychology um, yeah. when I met Judy Chicago mm -hmm. and started the first feminist art program at Fresno State. And it was, um, I was drawn to it because I had already been learning about feminism and it seemed to be the only feminist thing happening, even though I was in psychology, not in, in uh, visual arts. And um, at first she didn't even want me to be in her program. She thought I was going to become a psychologist, so I wasn't going to be an artist. Mm -hmm. And um, she learned to live that one down later. Um, but I followed her to CalArts, and mm -hmm. I wouldn't have gone to CalArts otherwise. Um, but she was taking the program there, and I just, it was an act of, of the heart, really. I was planning to go to med school and become a psychiatrist, and I just made a 90 degree change and, and headed off to Cal Arts. Mm -hmm. Once there, I was a working class kid from the San Joaquin Valley, a very small rural town. So I was pretty uneducated um, about anything in the avant-garde. And my idea of, paint, of art was you would paint, right? So I got to Cal Arts and was exposed to people like Baldessari and Alan Capro and um, all kinds of, Allison Knowles was there, Dick Higgins was there. A lot of people that, like Mali, um, my experience was really shaped by my uh, contingency with all these, you know, really incredible intellectuals, David Anton, Eleanor Anton, uh, people came through that weren't, weren't teaching there, Yvonne Rayner. Um, mm -hmm. So I got a kind of a crash course in avant-garde um, performance and happenings through Alan. Mm -hmm. Judy Judy was uh, uh, more of an object maker and very concerned with content and bringing this radical content into, uh, you know, I mean, she did performances as well, but her metier is really to make things that express what she considered a, a, a female consciousness. And um, I just discovered when there that it was going to be, it was going to take me years to learn how to draw and paint and, you know, all of that. So. <laughs> Uh, and really, you're still learning. <laughs> yeah, right, right. I'm still learning with Andrea. Thanks to Andrea Bowers. Um, but but I, um, uh, I, I was very drawn anyway to the ideas of the avant-garde and conceptual art and performance art, which was just then being formed. So that pretty much changed the course of my life, I think, uh, what took place at CalArts. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I would like to add something to it because... Uh, when I started in Dusseldorf, it's from 82 until 80, 85. Mm -hmm. So it was the time, I mean, um, Joseph Boyce was the king in the school. 
Mm. And so we have a lot of fruitless events in the school. Mm. So I think the, all this background um, was very, very interesting because um, uh, on the one hand, it forms my uh, formal language in the art, but also because of the social sculpture idea at the time, um, it forms the, the, the social content in my work as well. I think that's a really important point that, um, you know, in a sense, Judy helped enhance the feminist, the female identified voice and brought it into what was happening politically in the rest of the country, uh, U.S. around feminism. And, uh, and, but Alan was where I was, I was very interested in his way of thinking, his way of framing art um, and I, for me, I took that into, I sort of melded those two and took the formal language and the access to the kind of thinkers that we had at CalArts mm -hmm. and beyond and, yeah. and that made it into um, a kind of public, content-loaded, formal work. Yeah. And I mean, both of you talked about the, the artists who, you know, were there and the kind of events that would take place. And I was wondering, what was the curriculum like? Was it very open? Like, were you free to do what you wanted to at, in, at each of these places? Or, you know, was there kind of more a formal education? Um, yeah, uh, for me, I mean, Dusseldorf was one of the most avant-garde school at the time. Yes. So we don't have curriculum at all. Mm -hmm. So um, in general, we don't have so-called uh, class in a sense, you know, if you, if you learn uh, uh, with a certain professor, you just go to the studio and just do your own work. And then he will, he will show up once a while to discuss mm -hmm. uh, with your work, that's all. Yeah. But at the same time, certainly we have a lot of classes uh, in, in the school and it's, it's all free, you know, you, you can go to whatever class you want to. So mm -hmm. it was the kind of um, um, situation in Dusseldorf, it's very experimental, but mm -hmm. I, I heard later on they changed the whole school system now. Yeah. Oh. I think it, at CalArts it was probably not quite that open, but open. Mm -hmm. We had classes, you signed up for classes, you never got a grade, but you signed up for them. Mm -hmm. And, um, but, you know, like I took a dance class from Simone Forti and, you know, you could sort of wander around. You may not go into an advanced cinema class with Pat O'Neill because if you didn't know cinema, but frankly, he probably would have let me in anyway. Wow. But, but there was, I think, a few more class structures um, at CalArts. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And one question I had for both of you is, and you know, Suzanne, you earlier mentioned, you know, coming from a working class background in the San Joaquin Valley and kind of then coming to, you know, urban Los Angeles and the question of fitting in, because, you know, it's like there is, you know, how do you fit into this institution that where maybe the other kids don't, don't have that same background, right? And that's something that, that I think is very interesting in your case. And Molly, this was something I was also wondering what it was like to be a woman uh, at a school which, you know, where the professors were kind of very male, very, you know, kind of very prominent, right? But also to be coming from Taiwan to, to Germany and what was it like to be, to be studying there? Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, Suzanne, you want to go first? <laughs> go ahead. Oh, okay. Um, I, I mean, uh, before I went to Germany, I was very much uh, influenced by the feminism movement in Taiwan yeah. because one of my teachers in the university uh, was kind of key figure in the feminism, uh, feminist movement in Taiwan. Mm -hmm. So with that idea, I went to Germany. I didn't really pay attention to uh, the the gender issue at the time because they were uh, m much broader like social political issue at the time. For example, when I was in Dusseldorf, the, the Green Party was founded at the time. Mm -hmm. So you can see that it was really a time for change. You know, a lot of things was moving on 
And so uh, feminism wasn't that uh, my center focus. But only when I uh, went back to Taiwan um, in 86, and that's again also the time for change in Taiwan. So um, we have the, the Democratic Party was founded at the time because before that it was only one national party in Taiwan. So um, it was the time there are a lot of there were a lot of demonstrations on the street, etc. So we, yeah, so so uh, we I mean as as um, the so-called uh, scholars or artists, we all join join in that kind of uh, demonstrations. Mm -hmm. But then after after that, uh, I think the feminism movement in, in Taiwan became also very important because we realize very, it's very much like in the 60s, maybe mm -hmm. in the States, that there were a lot of anti-government movements, but, uh, but the women's voice wasn't heard. And so, um, so the women tried to get together to do something. For example, there are a lot of women's uh, professors uh, they form a kind of association and try to bring the women's uh, gender study into Taiwan. So mm -hmm. at the same time, uh, also the women artists were getting together, mm -hmm. uh, trying to uh, express ourselves through uh, exhibitions or, or events or even film screening mm -hmm. and discussing about certain topics around that. Yeah. And um, yeah, so while we are doing this, or m I myself, while I am, uh, I, while I was involved in, in all those very revolutionary uh, scenery at the time, I also tried to read uh, 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 some uh, articles on women's art. And that's how I encountered with like uh, Julie Chicago and Miriam Shapiro. So they were both uh, teachers of Susan Lacey. So mm -hmm. I think that was very interesting encounter, an indirect encounter somehow. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So that was, okay, so that would kind of led you to, to the feminist art program through the, the end of the kind of one party rule of Taiwan in 1987 and then kind of the opening up. Okay. Yeah. Suzanne, since uh, uh, Mali brought up the feminist art program, do you want to say what it was like for, for you to be kind of a first-hand? Uh... Yeah. Yeah, you know, um, um, my divergence from, my feeling out of place at CalArts was actually class-based, mm -hmm. not uh, gendered because of the feminist movement. And I had spent, what, five years in zoology mm -hmm. and a years in psychology with almost all men in my classes so having all men in my classes wouldn't have been at all unusual mm -hmm. uh, but when I got to Cal Arts it was a moment when there was you know the feminist design program with Sheila de Brettville where I taught feminist literature with um, uh, feminist writing with Dina Metzger feminist sociologist kind of like feminist everything and I remember um I think it was Ross Blackner said to me once uh, that he, I think it was Ross, that said that they were actually quite intimidated by all of us, the feminists, because we sort of stomped around in our room. <laughs> uh -huh. uh, was, you know, kind of the, the, the clothing style of the feminist at Cal Arts was we were ready with our hammers and nails and ready to take mm -hmm. on it. Uh, and um, no, it was Eric Fischel who said that, actually, that that they were, I didn't realize it, but they were quite terrified of us, apparently, all the undergraduate guys. Mm. Uh, so it, it was fun. I mean, it was like being, you know, it was like catnip for cats. Cal Arts was a place where you'd be sitting, watching the moon rise on a sunset, and suddenly you hear this chorus of voices break out and look, and there was a bunch of, you know, music students standing on the balcony singing to the rising moon. So... It was it, there was it was a lot of fun and a lot of um, ability to play, mm -hmm. and because of all the feminist programs, I felt pretty much at home. You know, I felt like it was okay being a woman. The class thing was very striking to me. Yeah, uh, I had been through mostly um, state government, uh, you know, pro uh, public schools, 
and to end up in a private school where people talked about going to the Bahamas for their Easter break was quite um, quite a shock for me. Mm, yeah. And did you feel like you had to kind of, you know, uh, like your experience, you had to kind of change it somehow because of that difference or was it? Well, I don't think so. I think we were so busy stomping around in our work boots and acting macho. <laughs> <laughs> really have to, you know, I didn't really feel bad about anything. And I formed very close bonds with people like Alan uh, Capro. He and I were quite close. And he he really uh, was one of the, not all the men did that, but he was one of the men that was very open to feminist ideas. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, so I mean, you know, you can't, each of you came to feminism through your experiences with mentor figures, it sounds like, you know, with, in the case, you know, of Cal Arts with Judy or, I mean, I, you, yeah. I came to feminism long before I met Judy, actually. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it's true. You were kind of instrumental in inviting Judy to start the Feminist Art Program. In some no, not at all. Not at all. No, she came to start the Feminist Art Program. I only suggested she bring T. Grace Atkinson uh, uh, okay. to the program and kind of feminists like that. Mm -hmm. But that was all Judy's idea. I mean, you know, feminism was an idea in between 69 and 71 in the United States, 68 and 71, that really was in the air. Mm -hmm. uh, Faith Wilding and I decided to start a feminist program yeah. at Fresno State, and we put up posters all over and said, come women, come and talk yeah. about feminism. And when we got to this room, there were like 40 women there. And we thought, oh, shoot, we didn't, we didn't plan anything. And she said, what should we talk about? And I said, well, let's talk about sex. <laughs> and that was the beginning of the feminist art movement, at, at uh, the feminist movement at Fresno State. Yeah. Judy started the art piece. Yeah. And it was quite radical, her vision. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I think, you know, both of you have your own radical visions, you know, um, that's very clear. And I was wondering if, you know, um, since we were talking about these formative experiences, if you could talk about, you know, the, the kind of the, um, the impact you've had on each other, because I think your meeting comes at a slightly later moment in the early 2000s, if I'm not uh, mistaken. Um, Molly, do you want to say a little more about that? I think you were at, in residence at the Headland Center, right? When, when yeah. Um, yeah, actually, um, when I began to work with the women's movement in Taiwan, so I, I was asked to work with a group of community women, mm -hmm. and uh, they are not from our background, and um, they are just housewives. So um when the the women's association they uh, when they wanted to work with this group of women they uh they didn't know how to begin with because those women they i mean those so-called housewives they are not interested in the politics nor do they interested in the fa so-called feminism so they just asked me to help and when i when I uh, get in contact with them, I found uh, they are great because they 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 are keen with these sewing materials, etc. So I I say why not that we develop a project uh, with each other? I mean together, and that's how I begin my project Awaken, Awakening in Your Skin. So maybe we can show uh, one images. Uh, that uh, we did the project in 2004. Mm. It's, it's also the time uh, when Suzanne came to Taiwan for the first time. Yeah. Yeah. So, okay. do we have the image ready? Yeah. So, uh, if we can have the image uh, of there. Yes, this one. Yes. Yeah. So, here you can see that's the project in 2004. Um, uh, and here you can see the the women I work with together. So at the time I was trying to bring some idea mm. and help them to uh, explore themselves through through the the uh, process or through the uh, 
the fabric and and it was very successful and this this uh, process really bring me to think of the art education because at the time i was also as part-time lecturer teaching in the university and also my activities were more um, most of them are in either in the museum or in the gallery. So it means I I was really working in the so-called art world and never really encountered with the so-called the general public. So this this cooperation really helped me to think uh, what's wrong with our art education, why we are always, you know, somehow uh, uh, very academic and also the art seems has nothing to do with the general public and yeah. so I, I, I was trying to bring changes so maybe we can see a little bit of video if we have the time for that I mean this 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 project uh, sure and, for the inferences and yeah yeah so that uh, you I mean找到玻璃鞋的主人以后其實我剛剛開始要表現是說你從小到大你不可能擁有一件東西那上個禮拜之後是整個心境是有改變Yeah, um, so from, from the video, you can see that although uh, uh, during our workshop, we began with the fabric, but later on, you can see that uh, those we know who has no, no uh, so-called art education, but later <laughs> all kinds of materials. 我這件衣服做的時候呢,其實因為我的感覺是覺得是說台灣的那個艾滋病裡面,大部分都是已婚婦女,所以呢,女性應該要有保護自己的自覺。<笑> <我說三萬對子比較平凡嘛, 笑> 經營蜕變成那個亮麗的蝴蝶他辛苦啊 okay. Now we can move to the image, the previous image uh, where we show the work uh, in the museum and Suzanne was there so we can see in that image that Suzanne was in the background actually did you see that it's on the on the, on the right hand side I mean on the back Yeah. Did you see that? Because from my screen, I don't really see it. Anyway, okay. Um, I actually learned a lot from this women group because um, I realized that uh, that we, we, we should change our way of uh, art education and also uh, I think how to engage the public into the, the art project will be very important. So. We, we just not, we, we are not just doing art so-called for the public but 
really engaging them and bringing also the social issues into it. So when I began to develop those projects, I was uh, also looking for uh, literature uh, uh, and also wanted to know how the artwork think about this kind of project. And then I uh, ha uh, happened to get into the Mapping the Terrain, I mean this book. And that's how I uh, began uh, to think uh, uh, whether it's possible to translate the book into Chinese. Yeah. So in the early 2000s, I, I'm not quite sure when was that, maybe 2001 or 2002, mm. I was in the residency uh, at the Hatlin uh, Center for the Arts for a short period at that time. Which so, is in fact, um, yeah. at the time, so the director, um, Mm -hmm. At the time, it's Catherine Wiesner. Mm -hmm. She was helping to contact Suzanne Lacey. So Suzanne came to visit one day, and mm -hmm. that's how we began to know each other. And we were talking about the possibility of translating the book. Yeah. So in 2004, when the book was published in Chinese in Taiwan, uh, at the time, the curator from the Taipei uh, city government, uh, the, uh, Zhou Xiao, mm. uh, she was a good friend of mine. So we were talking about that and thinking whether it would be possible to invite Susan Lacey mm -hmm. to come to also do a project. And that's how, how, how we really met uh, in, in, in Taiwan. So mm -hmm. at the time, Susan also has her project with the students here in Taiwan. Yeah. yeah. And uh, so that was part of the, the uh, festival that was called Taipei on the Move, right? And yes, yes. No. And it was really the very first public program in, in Taiwan. I mean, uh, in, in that, that sense, I mean, so-called so socially engaged art. Yeah. And my Emperor's New Closes was one of the program and mm -hmm. also as well uh, Susan's projects. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And Suzanne, so this was one of your, I think you mentioned this was one of your earliest projects in Asia, uh, working with uh, the community in Taipei. Do you want to say a little, I think the piece, uh, I'm not sure how to pronounce it, ID Entities, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. I have a couple of slides that you yeah. can show, two of them. Mm -hmm. And I worked with an architect, Nong Chi Wang, here, who it was Taiwanese. Mm -hmm. uh, Taiwanese Chinese, he lived here in LA and he designed those cunning little platforms where the strawberry generation, they called themselves, mm -hmm. young people who had been raised like precious strawberries without bruising were, were trying to sort of find their identity in a culture where they, they felt in a sense they'd been quite, <laughs> quite uh, protected. Uh, Mali would know more than I about the, that generation, but we, we worked with... Um, young people through school teachers in Taiwan and sort of brought them like a flash mob to this site in town to have these open air conversations about key issues in their in their lives, things mm -hmm. they were struggling with. Mm -hmm. And so at this point, this was something, you know, I think, uh, you know, Mapping the Train that Molly mentioned is a book that Suzanne edited and that had come out in the late 90s. Um, and it was kind of a very def defining uh, publication in thinking about social practice, right? Because, you know, the mapping the train was all about a new genre of public art, right? It was rethinking what public art could be, not just, yeah. It was actually, yes, but the new genre was the methodologies of art. Yeah. And public art. So it was combining performance and process mm -hmm. and installation when the typical ideas at that time in the early 90s, it, I think it came out mid 90s, 94, something mm -hmm. like that. Yeah. And in the early 90s, we, I sort of began to sit, there, there was always a strong community-based social art uh, mm -hmm. project going on in the United States since I began art and, and before that. Yeah. And but it wasn't particularly recognized. And, mm -hmm. and I discovered in the early 90s that public art was, was, which I thought we did, uh, yeah. those of us, Baca and myself, people involved with public culture and people that were outside the art world. Yeah. And, and then I discovered that um, uh, the, pub the public art people who were mostly object people, 
begin to kind of encroach on the territory of social, what, what is now called social practice. They would sort of land an object someplace and it would, it would um, really deeply upset people in communities. And so they would have to engage in some kind of dialogic process. But the dialogic process wasn't central to the work. Mm -hmm. So I began to, I did a series of projects that began to bring together people I knew yeah. that had differences in practice, everybody from Adrian Piper to Alan Capro, really yeah. different kinds of practices, but had some threads running through them that at least I identified as um, something uh, that was a kind of a, a North Star to where many of us that began working in the 70s were heading. Mm -hmm. And so we did a con conference with SF MoMA and Headlands, actually, and um, produced a three-day, well, we did a public event and then a three-day event where we all got together and um, the writers among us decided to do a book. Mm -hmm. And that book was Mapping the Terrain, New Genre Public Art. Yeah. So it, genre as in performance public art. At yeah. that point in time, I remember writing the NEA and... Um, uh, complaining uh, that they their public art projects didn't allow for anything that was temporal. So they hadn't integrated new kind of uh, dematerialized methodologies into their thinking. They were still thinking public art sculpture. Yeah. So, so having the terrain as a book was actually what I would call more than trying to name any a discipline. It was sort of a strategic intervention yeah. In I saw as the encroachment of um, sculpture into you know the territory of community-based practices. Yeah, well, I mean, I think that raises a really interesting point because I mean, you know, the idea that art is public. Of course, everyone thinks, oh, well, you know, people can anyone can go see art in an artwork, and you know, in the case of you know what traditionally has been thought of as public art, you kind of plop it in a plaza, and voila, it's public, right? But I think something that both you and Mali have been kind of really stressing is that, you know, in, the, in more traditional art education, uh, the artist is kind of taught to focus on the object, mm -hmm. on the, you know, the thing that kind of gets displayed. And mm -hmm. what both of you are talking about is kind of the, the need to connect with the actual public themselves, right? And how do you do that? And Suzanne, I think what you were just saying kind of really you know, is kind of shifting the attention. It's not so much that, you know, there is no engagement in public art, right? Like when you put this controversial piece in the plaza, then you have to have like dialogue. But I think what you're saying is in some, or what I'm hearing is in some ways, you know, with this new genre or kind of, it's kind of getting people to realize that that is there and that is something that artists can also kind of be in, be shaping, right? Or kind of thinking about as part of their work. Um, and that gets us, I think, to something that, you know, we were talking about in preparation for the, uh, the conversation, which is thinking about, you know, what is the role of the artist, right, within this larger kind of context or within this larger environment? Because on the one hand, you know, there's social activism, and on the other hand, there's, you know, just kind of plop art or kind of public art, but, but social practice is somewhere kind of in between, where in some ways, you know, you're, you're shifting the kind of the, the terrain, mapping the terrain, but also shifting the terrain, right, towards something which is about thinking about what is the artist's role within, with, in regard to the, to the community or to the public, right, or to, the, to society. Like, what, how do you engage? Is it just about getting a message out there, a la, you know, like Judy Chicago, or is it something that's maybe, you know, more um, hands-on in some ways? Right? Um, you know, I, I, um, I'm not really clear about the distinction between activism, object, and in the middle sit social practice. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure I would frame it that way. Um, yeah. I think that, that artists have always had different relationships with forms of publics and forms of politics. And um, I think most artists do recognize that the work is communicative. It, what happened in the 70s, I think, was as a result, I think, of various kinds of identity-based movements, the Black Power Movement, Feminist Movement, Latino Movement, and so on, which right in California we were in the middle of. And I think that as a result of that, like, like today, actually, interestingly, there was enough fomenting of 
of identity and oppression, how those two operated together, that it kind of introduced a new form of audience. Whereas before, when I began art, there was this kind of notion of a universal audience that would show up in a, in a gallery, the universal space. And of course, nobody noted that they were white, uh, upper middle class people. Yeah. So we think that, that as we began to kind of, as this audience came into view and that audience was more diverse and differently educated and understood creativity in different ways, I think that that plus this move to dematerialize sort of came together. Mm -hmm. and within that, people did what, you could look at it now and call it social practice. To me, new genre public art, community-based art, social practice, they're simply terms and the terms capture nuances of an evolving set of ideas. Yeah. And one of those, I, I've never held on to new genre public art particularly, mm -hmm. any one of those, uh, words is contested. If you talk to, you know, some of my activist um, friends in the POC world don't like the word social practice. They see it as kind of white elitist. Yeah. I happen to use it because it's an act, you know, it's an active word. It's a verb, practicing. Yeah. But, but I'm not held to it and we'll go on to another idea soon. So yeah. I think what's important is to understand these kind of processes, not as distinct entities, yeah. But as evolutions of, of ideas around what is essentially the political and the social. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Ali, um, I think, you know, mm -hmm. this maybe connects with what you were saying about earlier in your work with uh, women's groups, right? And kind of how you were engaging them and maybe how, like where you were engaging them too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, uh, with that experiences with the women's group, I realized that um, that uh, the artist role uh, can be as a st stimulator or a uh, catalyst because um, because I think especially um, uh, in the 90s, I mean, from the uh, late 80s until 90s, there are also a lot of um, social movement in Taiwan. Mm -hmm. And, and um, my work at the time was also try to reflect that kind of uh, social political um, situation. But I think um, uh, uh, to um, to set up a platform for dialogue would be very important because um, because my earlier work is very much uh, conceptual oriented and I just try to express my opinion and try to provoke uh, some social political issue in, in my installation work. But somehow I felt um, I was working in a very, uh, how to say that uh, it's it's a uh, how, uh, it's in a very oppositional um, position somehow, mm -hmm. and I felt that it won't work so well because you know it's only people who are interested in in the art will come to the museum to see mm -hmm. the work, but uh, the general public doesn't get it. So yeah. that's how I begin to bring the so-called art intervention idea. Mm -hmm. and, and also at that time, they were, uh, they were kind of new uh, public art phenomenon in Taiwan. They were a lot of um, art festival uh, which would invite uh, artists to do site-specific uh, art project mm -hmm. and all those work and all those uh, artwork although they are in public space but they don't really bring dialogue with the general public mm -hmm. and so I thought um, maybe it's really uh, uh, very important to bring the communication or dialogues with the general public through those projects that's how I begin uh, to work on, 
on the so-called uh, social socially engaged art. Yeah, mm. that's really interesting, uh, Molly, because you know I actually um, didn't have the advantage of the the you know you had a, I guess Cal Arts was an elitist education in terms of art world as mm -hmm. was yours. But mine, I was already formed as a kind of a, um, you know, I, I was probably about 25 at least by the time I went to CalArts. So I was pretty formulated in other kinds of disciplines and already pretty rooted my identity as a working class person. So I don't think I ever thought to challenge the art world hierarchies because I didn't see that I was part of it and didn't think I would be part of it. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so I think that we, we came to these ideas in, from very different places. Mm -hmm. And I think yours is the way that a lot of students who are educated in art schools and then begin to see their role as more public. I see that transformation. I guess what I'm saying is that based on my um, kind of populist, you know, mm -hmm. work mm -hmm. I, I didn't ever think I would have access to that world. And in fact, Capro and I had a lot of conversations about the way he could, as um, a, not only a white man, but a white man really steeped in art and contemporary art history, was able to navigate the gallery system such that he could claim to leave art, mm -hmm. you know. And I didn't see it that I was ever going to get into those circles and still don't think I'm in those circles. And mm -hmm. so for me, um, that kind of pri a privilege he had mm -hmm. of leaving art while he was still very much in art. Mm -hmm. yeah. but, but, you know, he, he was very helpful to me in, as you say, Molly, in mm -hmm. thinking about these kinds of ideas in more formal ways to frame them formally while you keep the discourse mm -hmm. of people going within the work. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's very interesting. But uh, as I said, I, I was working on those kind of projects in a, a kind of social political um, environment that, that we were trying to bring changes in all aspects mm -hmm. uh, in Taiwan. So it's not just about politics, it's not just about society, but also about the art education. And, and fortunately, I was, I mean, as a part-time lecturer in the university at the time, I try, I've tried to bring those ideas into the art world. Mm -hmm. But I would say I, 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 I was not the so-called important figure, I mean, in the art world, actually, because I don't have collectors and I, I, I mostly in, initiate other activities by myself or sometimes with some funding from government, that's all. Most of the project I've done not really uh, funded by the museum. Mm -hmm. It's interesting to me to, to see that as a choice on your part, because given, given your background uh, and the kind of education you had, and particularly in Germany with those people at that point in history, you could have gone in a very different direction. And I think your insistence, like the Housewives piece, which by the way, I love that video, it's really a great piece. And I think you're, you know, that, that housewife piece is a real clear to me declaration of I'm not going to follow that path. You know what I mean? It was a very strong position for an artist like you to take. It'd be kind of like Alan Capro deciding to work with housewives, you know, because mm -hmm. you have that kind of education. And, and mm -hmm. so I think there was a very interesting ethical choice that you must have known you were making, didn't yeah. you? Yeah, because I also read the the article by um, Alan Kaplow on the uh, education for non artists. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. But I think I think it was your values, your ethics, your position that led you in this direction, and that tends to be true for a lot of people who do what we might call social practice. Yeah. 
Yeah, and it's, I mean, I think what's interesting about what both of you are saying is, you know, whether because you are, you, you felt like you were from the outside or you felt like you needed to go outside the art system, right? Mm -hmm. It was like a choice to kind of work with, uh, with communities that were not represented within the art world. So that's one thing. But I think the other component, and maybe this is, you know, what uh, we were, you know, I was kind of thinking of when I was kind of differentiating between one form, a kind of a maybe vulgar form of activist art, which is just about message, right? You, you just kind of promote a message and you send it out there. But I think both, what both of you do, you know, is activist, but in a way that is about creating space or making room for conversation and dialogue, right? It's not just simply about like pushing aside or pushing propaganda, let's say. It's, it is about creating a kind of a, a community through conversation, through learning, right? Because it's not that you're the artist who occupies this kind of position of knowing. It's also that you're there to learn, to learn, to know from the people you're working with, right? Yeah, I, th I think for me, that's, um, you had asked us about the pedagogy in our work. And yeah. uh, I hadn't read Freire, but kind of innately you understand Freire if you're a, a somebody from a, um, a, a class that recognizes their own oppression or from mm -hmm. a and and you sort of get that in a classroom that the male teacher would be the power figure so when it comes uh, to thinking about education um, I, I and artwork for me um, I tend to I love listening to people and I love finding out about different kinds of people I'm just really curious about how people think and operate. And so for me, that gets combined with a kind of a curiosity about a certain political or social condition. Like how come those people don't get the right kind of health care? Yeah. And those kinds of questions are what I stand to, to learn about mm -hmm. when I open up a project. And so for me, they're deeply satisfying as personal learning <laughs> environments. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and then the obligation to an audience, I think, is the obligation to give back in some way, whether that's through teaching learning exchange or an enhancement of people's sense of self or to be able to say, yeah, together we're making a difference in this way that you will make your lives better. So I think that the teaching is about the artist learning mm -hmm. and also... Uh, a structure which itself as an artwork more pedagogic. I mean, I think uh, Mali's housewife piece mm -hmm. was deep, most deeply involved with self-esteem, obviously, and politicization of those women yeah. uh, in terms of gender politics. But I think there must have been lots of learning strategies, things that took place, learning to speak in public, learning to articulate you know, who you are that took place within the project itself. Yeah. Yes? No. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Sure. Yes. Yeah. Sorry, uh, because of the connection seems not so well. So partially I didn't quite get it. But yes, yeah. Um, I mean, um, I always try to to combine or engage in the public, no matter whether they are from the communities or from the school. So, um, so maybe I can sh also show uh, the other images of yeah. Chi Jin's project. Yes. And there, that the recent one. Uh, pardon me. That the most recent one. Mm. Yeah, the recent one. It's the recent one, and uh, just. Just to show a little bit um, how how I usually work, um, either in in community or in school. So from these images, you can see that we have a tiny space, which is a kitchen, which which was a kitchen, and we we try to use it again as a kitchen to cook art. And here, for example, in this image, you can see that we renovate the space which was a military space uh, in the 70s and, 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 not, and later on it, it became empty. Mm -hmm. And so we, we tried to uh, renovate the space 
and I use it uh, uh, for my class. And so because it's a, it's a kitchen, so we begin with food as a key issue. Mm -hmm. And from food, I try to understand um, what kind of people live in this particular village, uh, which is Qijin. And Qijin is actually a, a harbor village. It used to be a fisherman's village and later on became part of Kaohsiung Harbor, which is uh, very important uh, for economic, but also for, for the military sense. And so, um, and so, um, I mean, food was the media uh, for us, and, and we try to understand what kind of food we, we, we get in this particular place and where the food comes from and how, how is the test. Because since it's a, it's a harbor city, so there are a lot of foreign workers also live in surrounding. And also there are people, I mean, the Chinese, who came to Taiwan after the Second World War, who lived in, in this area. So it's a really very mixed uh, 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 people and mixed culture as well. So we were trying to explore what kind of food we get here, what's the taste. And through there, we try to understand why those people came to this particular place. And then we, we, we try to explore the whole historical background. So we understand that Xi Jinping was very important uh, in the uh, 17th century. So first it was the Portuguese cast by and later on the Dutch people came and also really uh, uh, controlled the whole space. And, and later on, I mean, the, also the, the Chinese, uh, um, I mean, when, when, when the Japanese controlled the whole Taiwan, they tried to, they tried to, um, to bring the whole infrastructure. And, and that's how the, the whole modernization began. And through this historical period, you can understand that different people, different group of people came to this particular place uh, uh, through different periods of time. So you, you can see that we, we try to use food through our own town uh, to understand what kind of taste we, we get and what kind of language we hear in this particular place. And from there, we try to explore the whole context, his uh, social and political context. And this is then uh, the uh, the curriculum I try to to bring into my class. Yeah. Maybe we can see a little bit the video, and so that uh, we can um, see this one particular chef we interviewed, and mm -hmm. through him we can understand the story of the place. In the Chinese 拿出一個飯刀然後噴那一個竹子叫它噴落來然後倒了一杯喝了以後他說他從來沒有喝過這麼好喝的酒那個綁布的香味他用那個最型號在寫的時候我心裡面都很感動他說他怎麼會把我們
Okay, yeah, so this it's just to give a kind of idea. Sorry, because I didn't quite get uh, what Susan was asking because of the, the connection, but I hope it, it fits in somehow. Yeah, well, definitely, I think, Molly, that was great because it really gives a, I think what you were talking about, Susan, uh, the kitchen kind of gives us an idea, uh, you know, that, I think what you're doing is less about providing answers than making space for people to ask questions, right? And learning, collectively learning about, about a, a context, about a situation. Um, and I think this kind of touches on what Suzanne was saying about the ethical position of the artist, right? It's less maybe to kind of come and kind of, you know, force an answer, but really kind of to create that room, to create that space. Um, yeah. Suzanne, do you have something you'd like to add? No, um, I, we're almost out of time. I don't know if you want to show a two-minute video clip of one of the projects that I sent. Yeah, maybe we can see just as a way, you know, a more recent project that you did on uh, Circle in the Square, perhaps. Yeah. You have that little clip? Yeah, sure, we can show that. How long, how long is it? Can you tell? Uh, I think we can show just a little bit of it. You know, I think it's short. I hope it's short. Mm -hmm. Let's see. I think it's three minutes. Probably, uh, that's all right, we can stop. Uh, that, that's a project in Northwest England in an abandoned um, textile mill where the, the small community of Muslims and um, British Christians had grown deeply apart mm -hmm. since the abandoning of the mills. And this project brought them together to sing um, Sufi chanting, uh, learning it from the Muslim people in town, and uh, shape note music from people who um, uh, were uh, of a Christian heritage. And it was a year-long project that was uh, about the reconnection of these communities and ended back in that mill with an installation of those songs. Maybe if, uh, yeah, that's all right, we could stop now. Yeah. So it, 
it's an installation now, but it's a it's a really beautiful film by uh, um, Mark uh, Thomas, the mm. film. It's part of this really elaborate series of installations on videos. Okay. Yeah, well, I love the, you know, we're closing uh, the conversation part of the, the, the today's program with the, both the kitchen and with singing um, and kind of very, you know, evocative activities. Um, I was wondering, uh, you know, lots of things. I have lots of questions, but in fact, so the, so the, the audience. Uh, and so I thought maybe what we can do now is maybe take some of those questions um, that mm -hmm. they've posted. Uh, so I will read a couple of them and maybe people uh, that, that are addressed, I think some of them to both of you and some of them to one of you. So I'll go ahead and read a couple of them. So the first one is, uh, how has feminism developed in art to now? I think that's something that we've touched on. Uh, next question from uh, our, my colleague Newport Desai, with the pandemic and the restriction on human interaction that comes with it, how do you think that it would impact the methods of socially engaged art practice? That's a really pertinent question, right? How do you envisage the future of socially engaged art practice in terms of its dialogical methods and participatory forms that has applied until now? I'm really deeply curious about this and curious about what Umali has to say because I'm, I, I'm not, I don't really know, but I have a feeling this is going to deep, deeply impact my work. I rely a lot, particularly since I work cross-racially and cross-culturally, I rely on my ability to communicate interest and sincerity um, at a very direct personal level. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm, I'm not really convinced that that kind of, of haptic presence mm -hmm. uh, is, can be communicated digitally. Plus, I tend to fly around a lot, um, an ecologically sound as it may be. Um, and, and I spend a lot of time with, like in that piece I showed you, I was there for a year, not, not solidly at one time, but I worked with that community for a year and I can go into their homes and have dinners and, you know, there's relationships that continue even now, three years later. Yeah. So, so I, I really don't know uh, and am only waiting for the COVID vaccine to come so I can go back to Moscow. <laughs> for the project I'm working on. What do you think? Do you, do you see it as deeply impacting our practices? I'm not so sure because Taiwan is not so affected by the coronavirus. And that's why I think, although we know the world will be different, but how far we we still don't know. But at the same time, we are so affected by the whole <laughs> political situation in the world, the American politics in the world. Mm. <laughs> so, it's really yeah. annoying somehow and bring also us really to think, you know, what will be the next, what will what will be happen in yeah, you know and I great situation. I think what's going to happen after we get through with so-called COVID is the uh, drastic economic inequities are going to start falling on our shoulders. And that, um, I mean, that's going to make it more and more difficult for people to live. Although I do think it's going to make it, um, uh, I mean, that is the territory often that social practice people work in. And for yeah. me, I, I'm deeply involved with, you know, issues of inequity and poverty yeah. in class, you know, so there'll be plenty to do. The question is, how do you operate with a level of commitment? I mean, there's too many flyby artists anyway, who sort of drop into a place and, you know, exploit the, the, the culture in some fashion and put it in a museum and leave again. And, um, I think it's going to be more difficult to give people that kind of consistent physical presence that at least that probably your work. Yeah, I know your work uh, demands. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I think that's going to change. Yeah. Yeah. So both in terms of a kind of epidemiological, but also economic system, this is going to have effects. And, mm -hmm. uh, interesting. Okay. Yeah. Um, I'm going to kind of continue with the questions because we have more more of them coming. Uh, one from uh, Tessa Maria Guazon from uh, Manila. 
when works from community-based engagements or cooperations are shown in exhibitions, how do you as artists mediate the transposition of digital context of the work to an exhibition setting? So I think Suzanne, this was something that was very clear in what you showed with the circles and the circle and the square. So um, I don't know if you have an answer to that. Yeah, I, I think about that a lot. I think uh, of that as the same kind of question that we took on in mapping the terrain. Mm -hmm. uh, at one point, you know, when in the 70s, when I started being an artist in 80s, I mean, I got a few shows, but, you know, I'm not a gallery artist. I, I, I'm not somebody that's in, in major collections. I'm like in one or two good collections and that's it. And, and so it was always easy to be, quote, pure. You know, I wasn't challenged. Um, but what I did think was important was to challenge the art, kind of the, the frame of thinking about what art was and who art's audience were, and that's the mapping the terrain and most of my work. Now I do have the opportunity to work in museums and I am often funded. Uh, I don't make a living at all on my work. I couldn't, there's just no way to do it. So I teach for a living, but I do get the projects not completely, but almost completely paid. And, and so that means there's some kind of institution behind it. Um, and, and that then, so, so the last three projects I've done, including that circle in the square, that was a year long project in a community, then a year long developing an installation. And then you don't see it, but in the rest of the video, and maybe you could post it on your site for people if they want to see it. It's only four or five minutes, about three minutes more. But after that, I put, the, we always understood in the community that we were making a film together and that the film would then go to museums. Mm -hmm. and, and the people that I worked with came into the editing room and they said, yeah, do this, no, don't do that. And so it's a very discursive process making it. And now it's a year later and the people have been traveling and it's going back to Manchester where it was born. And we will once again um, be engaged with those relationships and create work around the screening mm -hmm. of the museum installation. So the last three works that I've done have been explorations about how do you do an authentic work in a community and how, does, how do you do something that has the lingua franca of the art world in museums and show up with a different set of authenticities. Mm -hmm. You know, not betraying the people or, you know, taking their cultural capital, but regenerating the conversation and the ideas mm -hmm. that took place in that community. So mm -hmm. I think it's a really interesting thing to explore, but I don't think it's an easy question to answer. Mm -hmm. yeah. Usually you have skills in one area or the other, in the community or, or in galleries and museums. Okay. Molly, do you have thoughts on that? No, maybe we can move to the next. Okay, so uh, next question, Samson Wong uh, at, here in Hong Kong asks, I'd like to ask about your response to the question of, is this art? Do you get asked these question, this question? I talk about this with my students, but it also pops up from all kinds of people. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, we've been often asked by those kind of questions, but, but I mean, we have time. Sometimes uh, uh, how we determine art or what's the, uh, the, the contribution of an artist do, maybe it's just, maybe it's not defined by one or two projects. Maybe it's uh, defined by, the whole activities that the artist is doing. I would, I would cite um, social sculpture from uh, Joseph Boyce, you know, mm -hmm. because social sculpture means that uh, the artwork of the society is an organism so that it grows, grows. You, you will never know what it really looks like, but maybe by the end you, you will you, you will understand or, or you will see what what does art mean, yeah, mm -hmm. in the end. That's what I thought. <laughs> okay. 
Uh, now, the next two questions also have to do with education. So one of them says, uh, dialogue and communication is essential in social participatory art. How do we facilitate listening and interactive process? What is the next step after every individual expresses their feelings and opinions? Uh, and then uh, the, another question is, um, you know, how do you approach your practice now as educators and perhaps as mentors? Which lessons do you draw on and continue from your own education? From lessons do you break from or discontinue? Uh, I think Molly, you touched a little on this, you know. Um. Yeah, um, so uh, how do I, yeah, approach my practice? Well, I think maybe uh, what I have shown, I mean, the project also yeah. can answer that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, Suzanne, do you? Well, I, let me start with the first question on listening. I think that is a, a really important um, skill for students to learn. And I don't think it's an easy one. You have to remind them and then they have to have a natural, a natural curiosity. But I think listening, empathy, um, uh, a, a deep interest in other people, I think those are kind of prerequisites for doing social practice. And then you add on to that, um, uh, how do you um, get, the next question here is how do you get people to it, go beyond their feelings? And I think just briefly spoke, um, just say something about that briefly, is that you need to, for me, build a kind of a recognition of similarities between people or overlaps of feelings. And then I think, and this is a really a feminist idea, I think the idea of moving it then into the conversation, into an analysis. So when four, six women are sitting around and three of them have been raped and they're talking and three of them have been raped, then, you know, as you go into that experience and you understand that, then you also t begin to analyze it. Well, if three, if 50% of this group has been raped, what does that mean politically? Mm -hmm. You know, and then the next step is, if that is the political situation, how do you uh, how do you then move into action on that? You know, I feel like I'm turning into a um, I'm fading like. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and it's it's dramatic the kind of the the <laughs> duskiness is setting in. So, um, I th I think uh, we're kind of reaching the the, the end of our allotted time. And uh, Suzanne Cinderella is. <laughs> Okay. Okay. Again. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, thank you both, uh, uh, Molly and Suzanne, for joining us for this conversation. And it's been um, a fantastic hearing your thoughts and learning about you know your experiences and um, sharing your thoughts with our audience. And thank you to everyone for joining us, uh, both on Zoom and on Facebook. Um, life lessons will continue. Uh, I think the idea is that we do one of these a month, so be sure to stay tuned for a future uh, uh, series. And um, thank you again to uh, Molly and Suzanne for joining us yeah. for today. And um, yeah, thank you, John. Good morning. Love you. Yeah.